Thank you for joining us this evening for the Artists Exchange, a group created by and for artists to share new work, ideas, resources, and opportunities monthly over a glass of wine or tea as you prefer. Tonight I'm drinking water. <laughs> so grab your beverage and join us as we discover the work of two fiber artists, Ruth Tabenkier and Stephanie Metz. I'm Shelley Rugg, the Executive Director at Gallery Route One. And for our presentation today, we ask that you please stay muted unless we ask you to unmute. For best viewing, select speaker view from the top right corner of the Zoom viewing screen. We want you to know that we are recording today's presentation for future viewing on our website and YouTube channel. Now, please join me in welcoming our host, Pamela Blotner, an artist, educator, and curator who lives and works in the Bay Area. She has worked as a sculptor illustrator for the Houston Zoo, Houston, Texas, and the Leatherback Trust Conservation Organization, and as an artist designer for Human Rights Watch, Physicians for Human Rights, and the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center. Blotner's sculpture and drawings have been exhibited in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the United States. She has taught a number of universities, taught at a number of universities throughout the US. She is co-curator and founder with Mead Preckler of Artists Beyond Boundaries. Please welcome Pamela. Thank you, Shelley. That was, I think we'll have to edit that, but it was very nice. <laughs> okay. It's, um, it's my pleasure to get to introduce tonight's guests. And uh, both of whom I know, I know I've known Stephanie quite a while, and Ruth is a new friend. And very nice to see her. So, um, uh, um, okay, I've, I've confused myself with my own with my own notes. Um, I am going to introduce Ruth first, Ruth Devante studied microbiology in college and went on to become a pediatrician afterwards. After 11 years in private practice, she left medicine to study art. As a former uh, bacteriology major, images of microorganisms have always been part of her visual vocabulary. Her recent works have led her to embroider forms resembling larvae, fungi and bacteria on various single-use plastics with the hope that living forms will evolve to digest the plastics that are accumulating on the planet at an alarming rate. Welcome, Ruth. And just one question for you. Hasn't that already happened? Has, hasn't it been proven that that's one of the gyres has a, an eating bacteria? Um. Well, yes, it, it's taking place in the research laboratory right now, but it's far from practical. You, it's far from being practical to use. But I, I will mention, I will talk about that okay. in my presentation. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks everybody for coming today. Thank you, Pamela, for the introduction. Um, I've been asked to talk about how microbiology and microscopy influence my work. So um, if we could have the first slide, Shelley. Okay, <clears throat> great, thank you. Um, a lot of you have seen this image before. I made this in 20, in the year 2010. This is extending the useful life. And this series of teabag quilts started from an assignment where we were supposed to make so artwork out of something that we used every day. And at the time, my daughter and I were sitting in her bed, wrapped in comforters, doing geography homework, and saving all the tea bags on the windowsill. So that's how I got the idea to stitch these into a quilt. Next. Shelly? Yeah, thank you. Okay, on the left, is a transmission electron microscope view of squamous epithelium. Uh, and on the right, of course, is the detail of the tea bag quilt. So uh, in medical school, I looked at tissues of every part of the human body 
And so I was, you know, not knowing it at the time, forming these images in my mind about how artwork would get together. Um, over ten year, over the ten, over a ten year period, I made three tea bag bed quilts like this, and I'm grateful to the dozens of people who set aside their tea bags for me. Next. Okay, I'm standing in front of an installation called Serratia over San Francisco. And this bacteria, Serratia marcescens, was previously thought to be harmless in, in, um, harmless in nature. And it occurs in all shades of red. Although there was a controversial use of this by the army in the 1950s, where they injected bacteria, the Serratia bacteria into the San Francisco Bay uh, knowing that it would aerosolize and drift inland. And this was to check the vulnerability of the Bay Area to germ warfare. Unfortunately, this co coincided with an outbreak of urinary tract infection of serratia marcescens at a San Francisco hospital and a patient died of endocarditis. Although it wasn't proven to be the same strain the army used, it was clear now that this was a pathogen and not something that was harmless and it's one of the main causes of nosocomial infection in the hospital setting. Okay, next. Um, this is entitled, this is half of a piece, entitled What's In You and On You 3.0. And I say 3.0 because this is the third time I've made a large grouping. And the total installation of this piece is 50 Petri dishes. Yeah, you're only seeing about 21 here. While I was a student um, in microbiology, I saw bacteria uh, in Petri dishes and in slides. And I think those images just kind of stuck with me. Um, we, uh, in medical school, even more bacteria. We learned about the diseases. And in these um, particular dishes, I've embroidered a particular bacteria with characteristics that speak to that bacteria. For example, in the upper right is anthrax. They have bipolar staining. Um, in the lower right, uh, staphylococcus, which arranges itself, themselves in clumps. The lower left is tuberculosis, which aligns itself by sticking in parallel groupings to itself. Okay, next. So what I've done is I've picked colors that represent the bacteria. There's a lot of purple and pink and pinky orange in my group because the two main stains, two main colors of the gram stain, the main one used for identifying bacteria are purple for gram positive organisms, which would be things like mostly skin organisms and a pink or, excuse me, a pinky orange color, which, uh, is called gram negative, and that's for a lot, most of the other organisms. And they tend to be mostly gastrointestinal organisms. So on the upper left, so going clockwise, uh, we're seeing normal flora of the mouth. And let me see what we're seeing here, streptococcus, staphylococcus, haemophilus, some lactobacilli, and corinne bacterium. And that's part of the normal mouth flora. On the upper right, uh, I've embroidered gram negative salmonella, uh, which is uh, typified by all these flagella that occur all the way around the, um, the bacterium. Next is Aspergillus fumigata. And this is kind of thing you might see on moldy bread. And uh, the next one is uh, mycelia. And I've used embroidered a with a feather stitch. And, you know, a lot of these things are so, to me, are just so similar in real life. It's almost hard for me to not think about them as not being the actual thing. Okay, next. Okay, um, what I've done now is I've taken that bacteria image and used it to combine with um, plastic, hopefully, plastic recycling, this is an imagine, something I would imagine. But I started working on this, this project, this body of work about five years ago, when I thought, well, what if bacteria or, or, or moss could live on plastic? So I started embroidering a plastic bag. 
And then I started researching it more and found out that, in fact, that there is a kind of mealworm. Uh, Tenebrio is a genus, and apparently there are thousands of uh, species of Tenebrio. This mealworm actually can digest styrofoam as its sole diet. So after plastic bags, I started uh, embroidering these maggots on styrofoam trays. And I have a lot of these trays because this type of stitch is really fun to make. So I started then looking for other plastics I could embroider on. And this is a third of a series of plastics that I've been working on for a little more than a year now. Okay, next. Okay, this is just a little bit more of a close up. Over on the left, you can see uh, the maggots, which I think look pretty lifelike, you know, for me anyway. I've embroidered maggots on a straw, on a red plastic cup, on bubble wrap. And that's a take up food box in the center on the bottom. It just saved that box, stepped on it and started, it, started to make stitches on it. On the lower left, that's a stitch called branching septate hyphae. And on the upper right, um, that stitch is called, uh, that's a mycelia, a feather stitch to represent mycelia. And I don't know if you can tell, but I really have a fondness for thank you bags. So both of these bags and all the ones that I use have thank you written them on them on some way. And I, I kind of wonder who are we thanking and what for? And, you know, it's just kind of, I don't know, it, it just seems mindless. It's like smiley face, just something to say. How are we doing on time, Shelley? Hello? I think we're doing okay. I think you okay. have a few minutes. Okay. Okay, can we go next? Okay, this is um, an older piece. This is called Crenation. And when I was working in the hospital laboratory and also in medical school, I saw hundreds of slides of red blood cells not all just normal ones, but a lot of diseased ones, a lot of ones depicting diseases. But when I'm looking at slides, one of the things that would come up every once in a while is something called a crenated red blood cell. And it's a staining artifact. But when I would find them, sometimes I'd call people over to look at them. And if you, you know, find a group of them, you felt really happy. <laughs> so I started to make these uh, in felt, actually. This is wet felting. And the way it's made, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, the way it's made is that I lay wool roving, which is wisps of wool on both sides of a flat foam disc. Uh, the disc is about an eighth, eighth of an inch thick. And then I felt that mixing together the fibers with wool and soap, massaging them. And when they're all blended together, I make a slit in the wool pull out that piece of foam and now have a hollow pancake. So I get in there with a, a wooden spoon in my hand and stretch it into um, a, a spherical shape. So these are hollow. Uh, there's some on the wall behind me. And those little protrusions are areas where I purposely put a higher density of wool. I'm weighing out this out on a gram scale because that wool would not shrink as much as a surrounding wool and it makes these protrusions. Um, I love this shape. I think this is my favorite three-dimensional shape. It occurs in nature and things like pollen, uh, seed spores, um, viruses. Anyway, I, I love the shape and you'll keep seeing it in my work. Can you go to the next one? Okay. Um, this is my idea of a coronavirus. And coronaviruses are not new. This is the first time most people have heard of coronavirus. But they were discovered in the mid-1960s. And when I learned about them, they were, uh, they were a disease that caused um, mild respiratory symptoms, mild to moderate respiratory symptoms. We thought of it as a, the cause of the common cold. and. <clears throat> So since this is, you know, since I started collecting all of these uh, caps, and I'll tell you why I've been collecting these caps. Um, about nine years ago, I was diagnosed with a chronic lung disease. I started saving all kinds of medical plastic that was like one use, then throw away. I started saving that. 
And then three years ago, I had even more plastic to save because I had a lung transplant and even more kinds of injectables came into my hands. So <clears throat> that lung transplant was about three or four months before COVID hit. And I knew I had to make viral forms out of them. So these are actually needle caps from syringes, excuse me, and needle sheets. from um, a piece that I call my corona, though it doesn't really look like the coronavirus that everybody's been seeing lately. In my mind, coronavirus, to me, I hark back to the images that I saw in college, and this looks very similar to that. <clears throat> Can you go to the next one? Shelly, how are we doing on time? Hello? Shelly? <laughs> if we could go back to the previous one. Okay, this uh, is a piece of, that I, I call bleached, and it's about bleaching of the coral reefs. Um, I think most people know what that is, but uh, we've now had, the Great Barrier Reef now has had its sixth major bleaching event since the late 90s. Uh, because of global warming, in large part due to burning of fossil fuels, the temperature of the ocean has gone up a little bit. And as little as two degrees uh, Fahrenheit can cause a bleaching event to the coral reefs. So corals are actually in a mutual realist, mutualistic relationship with the algae, zooxanthellae. And when the corals are stressed by heat, they expel the algae, leaving behind a bony skeleton. And if the, if, the, uh, if the bleaching event is brief, the corals can recover. But if it's a long time that, for example, under stress, the, the corals will not recover. So I took my favorite three-dimensional shape, made these imaginary coral pieces with all different kinds of, uh, of plastic that I've been accumulating. Can you go to the next one? Okay, so here there are, are these insulin caps. There are uh, vial caps. There's oxygen tubing. Uh, and the crochet I've made um, to in the form called hyperbolic crochet. It's a form where we see a lot in nature. You see it in coral reefs, sea slugs, lettuces. Uh, it, it's... It, to me, it's it's kind of a fun thing to do and also really fun to look at and really fun to plunge your hands into. So uh, yeah, I just want to say one more thing that even though I love this piece, it's a symbol of conflict to me because I depend on these medications to live, basically. I, I need these. And while I really hate plastic and I try to keep so much out of it, as much out of my house as I can, it's a conflict for me that that I have to have these, yet I know that their manufacture, you know, their presence is harming is harming the world. Okay, that, that's all I have to say. Okay, well, well done, well done, Ruth. And I should say that you're one of the few right brain, left brain people that I know. Oh, really? <laughs> it's very exciting. Okay, um, let's move over and uh, talk about and to um, Stephanie Metz. Stephanie Metz is a visual artist who blends art and science, again, the natural and unnatural into uncanny textile fiber-based sculpture to connect kindred spirits. The artist uses specially designed felting needles and sheep's wool to create what she calls dueling responses in her biomorphic and or animal forms. Depending on its use, she writes, wool is noble or humble, artsy or craftsy, sophisticated or simple. So it seems fitting that I embrace a complicated material to reflect a complicated world. And now to hear from a woman who can see the mountain and the grain of sand at the same time, Stephanie. Well, thank you. I'm really honored to be here, and it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful person to be talking to and following after, as intimidating as this is. Let me share my screen, and I will 
share my slides. So thank you again for having me. Uh, this, uh, I love, I, my work is also biologically inspired, but I am not at all professionally trained in it. I'm more of an amateur, but the origin of the word amateur is lover because I've always loved science and nature and specimens from life. And that's my starting point. Uh, in this first image, this is me hugging one of my large hanging pods, these touchable pieces that are definitely inspired by organic forms, but I love to kind of bring together contrast and sort of push the limits on what might be real and what is imaginary. So I'm gonna walk you through some of these different pieces that I've done in the past that really blend kind of the, uh, the biological with my imagined uh, angles on it. First of all, though, I wanna start by giving a quick rundown on what my art form actually is because I mostly work in needle felting. That's where you tangle fibers using specialized needles to compress and, and make them become essentially a solid mass using special tools that I'll show you in a moment. But it works because wool fibers are covered in little overlapping scales like human hair, like you see on shampoo commercials. So this little piece is, is essentially solid, but a little bit squishy felt, wool. So the tools I use are called felting needles. I have little handles I can use to have multiple needles at once. But as you can see in my little cartoony drawing, the tips of the needles have little notches cut in them. They're not like sewing needles, they're not smooth. They snag on the fibers as you use them. So if you wanna make a sphere, you poke into a mass of wool from all sides towards the center. If you wanna make like a belly button or a hole, you poke repeatedly in one place. If you wanna make a little line or a crevice, you poke in a line. So you can make really simple shapes and break things down into their component parts and join them together by poking through one into the other, adding more wool and smoothing it out and getting increasing detail. So when I stumbled across this, I jumped right in with the kind of things that I had done in the past. My schooling is in traditional figurative sculpture, but using clay and stone and metal. And when I came across this weird process, that is what I started doing with it. I love it that with the human form, especially for so much of sculpture, it is, it's created out of hard, rigid, cold materials. And suddenly here is this way to make these warm, soft, organic kind of shapes out of an organic material. However, when I first stumbled across it, all I had seen was, you know, cutesy little toadstools and fairies and, and things like that. I actually physically learned how to do needle felting from this book. I had a friend at a frame shop I worked at tell me about wet felting, which Ruth described, it's another way to put it is, take a nice wool sweater, throw it in the wash, and it comes out as this shrunken little dense doll size sweater. That's wet felting. This book taught me needle felting, which is mechanically doing it by stabbing at the forms. But I didn't trust it at first. I didn't think it could be real art material because I didn't, you know, I thought of it as this, you know, too soft kind of thing. But so I sort of challenged myself to try to create it in the forms of the more noble materials or whatever that means. So this is kind of a, a portrait bust in the style of marble portraiture. And then with the figures, for example, for this one, I filled in the space under the leg because I wanted it to look like it was hewn from a solid mass, not a doll or a toy. And I really loved how I, I quickly figured out that I could make these forms stand on their own with really simple armatures and really kind of represent motion in life, the way that you could in a bronze statue leaping off a base. So with this jackrabbit form, there's a very simple wire going up the three legs that encounter the base, but then the ears are totally self-supporting because I just made it really, made it really dense and firm where the anatomy would suggest in the real animal it should be dense and firm. And then I decided I needed to try to make a really hard, smooth form out of this. So I wanted to make a sheep skull out of sheep's wool because that seemed funny to me. So I went to my favorite museum, the California Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park, where I've gone since I was a child. And they had this skulls exhibit mounted. And so I was working from that. And that was a really, that was a turning point for me because not only was, did I find that yes, I can really manipulate this material that way too, but in the case next to it, there was one of all these different domestic dog breeds. So on the left, that's a bulldog. On the right, it's a collie. And I just, it's so fascinating to me that they can be so different and, and just be different dogs. So I was thinking about how, you know, from your basic wolf form, you can, humans over time have emphasized the mutations that occur to create all these different crazy looking breeds that serve different purposes or just look a certain way. And it all kind of clicked for me that I could use this weird material to represent the way people shape the biological world around them in a really seemingly direct way because it looked kind of like living things because it's furry and soft. So this is my headless herd beast that is only meant to reproduce itself. 
And it's a little bit like, see, people see it as kind of dark or kind of funny, or it's kind of a, a way in. I'm, I'm there for both approaches. This is a little legless lap dog because, you know, these kinds of dogs you just carry around. They don't actually need to be uh, walking anywhere. So I, you know, do a couple of sketches. And this was actually the first one where I added little taxidermy eyes. Because again, before I didn't want things to seem like they would be dolls or toys. And when you look around, there are a lot of weird things that actually exist in life in terms of, you know, little creatures like this. So it didn't seem that far off reality. So I did a series of these kind of sort of dark, but sort of funny extremes of imagined biology in the future. And then going back to that uh, sheep skull, that at the same time, I was thinking, well, clearly what you'd find inside a stuffed animal would be a skull made of this material. And so I needed to make some teddy bear skulls. Now, normally skulls don't have ears because they're made of cartilage. But hey, when you're making it up, you get to make up the rules. So I love the idea that humans have taken this animal that could kill you and eat you and made it cute with, you know, little bow ties and kitsy woodsy vests and things. And I wanted to make the, the fake science behind the fake animal. So I got a bunch of different specimens of teddy bears with all different shapes and sizes of noses and eyes and I, I measured out you know where they would be to make them different and I made this whole series and I gave them teeth because of course they have teeth and I'm not a crazy teddy bear person but they're such an interesting symbol although for me also some people know me through this work and it seems to divide people into either you know oh it's a sign of death of a childhood icon or for me what it is it's evidence of life that's what skulls represent to me so it's kind of an interesting blurring of the line and then also combining materials has been a way to kind of push that, that blur, the, the push and pull of the wool, since it's so soft and welcoming. I once stumbled across a package of porcupine quills and decided that I needed to incorporate those. So in this piece, I've used the brown and white porcupine quills as a really direct contrast, although quills are also just a modified form of hair. So with these ones, it's really interesting to me that People really want to touch them, even though they're clearly quite sharp. It's sort of ridiculous how much people want to touch even the dangerous things. And that's just sort of an interesting part of human nature to me, too. I think a lot of art making for me comes from curiosity. And I think that's something that a lot of people share that, you know, what engages you in life is things that make you curious. And maybe you're curious about how sharp that is and you want to find out with your finger, which I don't advise. Here's another one where it's, again, hard to keep people from putting their finger in there to test. It is truly quite sharp. But the whole idea of the push and pull goes way back in my own family history. Uh, in my family, we're all very ophidiophobic, afraid of snakes. And it goes back to my dad growing up on a farm and there was a rattlesnake story. But uh, we have this saying in my family, when you see something that kind of draws you in but pushes you back, it's like looking at a snake. I don't know if everybody has that saying or just my family, but so, but my mom had this lame evening bag made of this mesh that was kind of snaky and, and, but we loved it, even though it was kind of creepy. So I found some and I started making some pieces that incorporated it kind of like protective, but sort of bling protection for the strange creature. It is really very much like chain mail, but although it's beautiful, I also like to kind of put the other side in and give it these kind of little biological details that make it a little bit, make you step back and think about this thing differently as well. So the contrast between like hard parts of things and soft parts of things and trying to make them make sense and looking to nature to see what forms actually look like in nature and then playing with them is, has long been a part of my practice, but also the desire for people to, that people have the desire to touch has been something that has been with me since the beginning. And so when people will hover over my work at a show, I'll often say, you know, I'm the artist, if your hands are clean, you can touch it. And I noticed again and again that people would then turn to their neighbor, whether they knew the person or if it was a total stranger, to exclaim over the experience. And I really love that idea of people kind of connecting, even just, you know, fleetingly by touching the art. So in 2016, 17, I started with this project, coming up with these ideas of these, these dramatically touchable human-sized pieces that people could walk among and experience through touch. And it required that I really change the way I work because to make things so large, I would need to not just poke and poke and poke at the wool to build it up, but instead I had to design forms underneath. And I made them out of really thick industrial felt. So cutting that out and hand stitching it together and stuffing it with different materials. And then I had volunteers come into my studio for felting parties 
to help me apply the white wool over the surfaces of these forms that I had created. And so the, the, the social element of it was really a wonderful part of this. And this work was then exhibited at the De Sisse Museum at Santa Clara University about two months before COVID struck. Luckily, in those two months, we got a lot of people in who got to finally indulge in their desire to touch these weird but very uh, alluring forms that were kind of familiar. I mean, they look, you know, kind of biological, but they're also kind of mysterious. And that whole indulging in curiosity is that really came out with this project. And I loved it that you know, people of all ages would react in different ways. And it probably depended on with, whether they were alone in the space or if there was a group around them. It was just really incredible to see this come to fruition. And while the show had to go dark for a long time and then come down, some of these pieces are getting out in the world again and there are some up right now. Again, curiosity. I love to know how people make things and I tend to assume that other people wanna know that as well. So along the course of making these touchable things, I also took a ton of photos and videos and I put them together into a documentary. So if you wanna see a lot more about how I actually made these, you can go on YouTube and just look me up, Stephanie Met Sculpture, and you'll see the documentary about it. So curiosity, I may not be trained in biology, but I am a curious person who pays attention to details and that really informs my work. And that I think is, is one of kind of the hallmarks of artists too, is paying attention to the things that you pay attention to. And I know it seems like from Ruth's work that that's, you know, that's definitely a part, I'm assuming a part of what you do too. So I'm excited to talk to you about that as well. And then we are back to me hugging these weird big forms. And that's what I've got. So let me stop sharing my screen and we can talk to each other more. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That, that's great. Um, it's lovely to find out how you do things, um, especially since you're the person who inspired me to start doing needle felting. But even more interesting than that is, is waiting to hear what you guys want to know about each other and each other's work. So should I call on someone? Let's see. No, I think we'll start out with Stephanie. Um, I have, I, I definitely have lots of questions. I really, really admire your work. I love how tactile it is. And I'm curious if you were immediately drawn to fiber when you left the medical world, if was that the medium that, that drew you in? And if so, why? Yeah, you know, I, as a child, I worked with all kinds of fiber techniques. I didn't know what to call them then, but I saw my mother crocheting, so I wanted to crochet. I saw her embroidering, so I wanted to embroider. So I tried those things as a, as a young child, and I I found the repetition. People are, in textiles often talk about the repetition. I found the repetition soothing, meditative. Um, I taught myself how to knit later on. I learned how to sew in middle school. So I feel like a lot of the times in my life, even though I was in school, I was working on some kind of project. You know, crochet is really easy to pick up and, and take around. So I've had a lifelong affair with <laughs> textile techniques. Well, I know that when I was in college, I avoided, I studiously avoided the textile department because most of what I saw was weaving. And at the time that seemed too flat to me. And it mm -hmm. just wasn't something I even considered until years later. I'm, and I know that, you know, as someone who works with fiber, we get pushed back about like, is this art or craft and whatever that means. And, and again, it took me a while to take it seriously as a thing that I could actually use for a real art. Did you ever feel, or do you still feel that kind of challenge from, from others or from yourself as far as your material? Yeah, you know, um, you know, one of the reasons I left medicine, you know, it, it was a hard decision in a lot of ways, but, you know, I felt like here I was doing all of these patterns that somebody else made and making pattern, pattern. And I was trying to figure out how to do something and it was how to do something original and I was kind of stuck because I'd never pursued art at all in my life. I, I was told myself I couldn't draw, so I didn't draw. And I don't know, there's something that I, I just felt this urge to make something that was my own. And it was so vague at the time, it was really risky because I didn't know if I was really gonna 
if, if anything would come out of it. So uh, actually when I started art school, I didn't take weaving until the second or third year. It was not the first thing that I went to. So, you know, cause I felt like I had to learn more about the basics. I had to learn the history and theory, things like that. Um, let me let me uh, break in and ask uh, ask Ruth mm -hmm. if you have one more question before we turn it over to our listening audience. And I'm thrilled to see that I know a number of the audience, and they're both good friends and very good artists. So thank you so much for coming. Yeah, Ruth. you know I. I knew that we were going to have this conversation. <laughs> so I thought a little bit about it ahead of time. I looked at your work and, you know, um, I just want to let people know that um, I met Stephanie very, very early on when you had made out of a pair of pink children, uh, girls tights. I think they were baby pigs that you yeah. had felt, you felt yeah. it on. They were meant to be puppies, but I was okay. thinking about how baby mammals all look fairly similar. And they all look like piles of sausages. So I decided to, to stuff the tights kind of like sausages and, and then add on little limbs and things. Yeah. I forget, do you remember where that was? That, you yeah, saw? that was at Olive Hyde Gallery. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, and that was, yeah, I was just floored by your creativity there. And I was just so happy to see more and more of your work coming out. Nice. Um, you know, as I was looking at your work, you know, you started with some of the classical statues and other um other forms. And I think, uh, you know, one of the, I don't know if it's a rule, but um, people always say, don't touch the art, you know, not people. Yeah. Galleries or museums, whatever. So I, I, you know, I was just thrilled to be able to, to be one of those few people who could actually see your in touch installation at, at the DSSA. And um, what I noticed looking at the pictures, well, you know, you chose these pictures is a lot of people want to hug them, not just touch them. They want to hug them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I found that, you know, I'm, I'm still cogitating that, what that means when people really want to do more than touch. But about those hanging pots, you know, I felt like I was in a, a room for a Return of the Body Snatchers or something. <laughs> and uh, that each one of those contained some kind of creature. And I would love to see that creature, actually. <laughs> You're not, you're not the first person to talk about invasion of the body snatchers. Um, I feel like one thing I love about making things relatively abstract and suggestive uh -huh. is that people get to interpret them in different ways. And for me, the kind of cocoon-like forms speak of, of potential and mm -hmm. new life and what could yeah. come out of it, whether it's scary or beautiful or somewhere in between. But um, it's, and then the whole issue of letting people touch and hug things. Even before COVID, we had, you know, we planned this all out with, uh, uh, hand wash stations at the entrance to the to the space, but not knowing how people would engage. Wool is really, really uh, robust material wise. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make it dirty, believe it or not, even though it's white. It repels moisture. It repels um, micro well, microbes. It repels uh, uh, it's antibacterial because it has the coating of lanolin on it on mm -hmm. a microscopic level. But um, yeah, the idea of opening it up to people getting to engage was like it was terrifying and exciting at the same time. And I think people have just such a need to engage with the world through touch. We have these sensitive fingertips for a reason. And I think now it's even more poignant, you know, I can't exactly say after COVID because we're still in COVID, but you know, the word, the hanging pods are actually getting out in the world a little bit more. People are pretty grateful to get to touch things. But it definitely has a different, you know, we have a different filter on now thinking about, you know, sharing space and sharing textiles and surfaces with other people that we didn't really think about before. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really interesting. And because I had no, back to the little, you know, puppy piglet forms, there was very little that I had seen before of anything needle felted. So I felt pretty wide open to just make whatever and just... Mm -hmm. There was no one who was going to tell me what not to do because there were no real rules. With a lot of textile techniques, there's a really uh, historical right way to do it. And if you're not doing it that way, you're not doing it that way for a reason. But I feel like it's been really uh, pretty exhilarating that there's no path. So we get to make our own path. And that's pretty We fun. do. We do. I see the textile techniques that I use as like kind of like a vehicle. You know, what can I ride on? You know, where, where can I what can I ride on to make this uh to make this concept work. And so, 
you know, uh, the microbes, things about microbiology, that's just one of the kinds of work that I do. It's like more an idea. And then how can I use any kind of textile techniques or how, how would that work? Right now I'm working on the installation of red blood cells. I'm making about a thousand of them. And like, what kind of textile technique could I use to make red blood cells? So I found a, a sphere. I, I could crochet a sphere and squash it. And it would kind of have that discoid shape of a red blood cell. Yeah. And then I'm grinding the centers to kind of make that depression, make that discoid shape. So, you know, there's always a way, I think a lot of ways uh, to use textiles to make something. Yeah, so it's fun. I got, I have to make over a thousand of these. So they're gonna go in the dryer. They're gonna go and, you know, I'm gonna grind my heel into them and see, see what's the best way to get that, that discoid shape, you know, keep the outer part a little full, but then be really dense in the middle. Have you considered needle felting? I have considered, <laughs> yes. I have considered needle felting the centers together. Um, and it, you know, I actually have to go buy some more needles because I looked at them lately and they were kind of rusty. You know, they, they do, right? After a while, if you don't use them, they, you know, first of all, they're not as sharp but uh, I, I need to get really good quality ones. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for that because you showed me how to do a long, long time ago in a workshop, how to um, take these uh, liquid amber seeds, seeds from the sweet gum tree right. and hold them together with wool. And it was a way I had never thought of. So you're, you, have, you, you have a way of connecting all that also. Which is great. Yeah. Well, I should I'm talk loving... to you more about I should talk to you more about this when I have a yeah. problem with something. I, I'm loving this love connection and I hate to interrupt, but um I think it's time that we open up the floor to our audience. So if anyone has any comments or questions um for our artists, this is the time. It looks like Karina Stover has a hand up. Fantastic. What's up, Karina? Can you see her? I see the uh, the video is not on. There we go. There she goes. Okay. Oh, okay. I see that you're. I see that you're. Oh, there we go. Okay, you're not muted. I'm go. in the. I'm in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Oh. Oh, I know why. Okay, sorry. I'm in the dark. I'm in the bedroom. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say to both of you that I'm so inspired by your methods of using materials. And I have to say, especially you, Ruth, recycling plastics and things like that, especially medical plastics, which I have a few of, which I'd send to you. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I also think that both of you should really reach out to kids to inspire them to get new ways of doing art. Because I think that we're often taught art is pencils, paint, mm -hmm. you know, things that are kind of not boring, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the creativity that both of you use is wonderful. So I don't really have a question um, unless the question is, have you had any way of reaching out to young aspiring artists in giving them some ideas for your art to, to you know, expand their um, forms of art? Um, I will say that I was invited to do some talks to a whole a school, groups of classes by groups of classes, um, I guess, before COVID. Um, along with the um, along with the needle felting, I'm also doing a lot of just stitching forms with that really thick industrial felt and making these forms that people can play with and move around that are very different than what you think of when you think of sculpture. And I got to present that work to kids from I think, kindergarten through fifth grade. And it was really, it's really interesting to see their, you know, minds expand of what art even is because they're, you know, taught very particular things. And in classrooms, there's not a ton you can do, 
But, um, and then I've also presented to groups that are doing like stitching and patterning. The stabbing with sharp needles is not something I do with you little kids that much. Even when I, when I do adult classes, there's always at least one person who's like the sacrificial one who's always stabbing themselves and drawing blood. But um, there are, I know that there are a lot of schools that do needle felting. The, uh, I can't remember the name of the kind of schools, but yes, yeah, showing the different needle arts and the textile arts and the soft arts is something that I think more people are aware of. Ruth, have you done any presentations or, or teaching for kids? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was asked one time to bring tea bags to a middle school class because uh, the teacher really liked the quilt. I, I believe I brought the whole quilt in. They were, the first one was smaller and uh, the kids sat and stitched tea bags to a piece of muslin. You know, and it was just a simple exercise. They took it home, I don't know what they did with it. But you know, I think that was something that was new to them you know, working with a needle and thread. Cause I've done that kind of school quilt thing with kids before, but with fabric, not with something that's unusual. So hopefully they brought it home and people and their families go, what's this, you know? So, yeah, but uh, otherwise uh, not, not too much. That's, that's the main thing that I've been involved with. Um, I see another hand up, um, Stephen Hurwitz. What do you have to say? You know, um, the first thing I'm struck with is how inventive you both are. Uh, these are definitely non-traditional. Um, and I, and it's, you know, they're real problem solving. And um, I, that's one of the things that I think elevates it to a fine art rather than a craft. Although I don't, uh, I don't generally buy into the distinction. I think that uh, anything's art, if it reaches out and touches someone, I don't care if it's a found object, I don't care what it is. If people are touched uh, in some way, then uh, I feel that it's art. But I have another uh, thought is that I feel that uh, that everything we do as artists is autobiographical. And I'm wondering, uh, both of you, how you see um, what you're doing in a very personal sense as to, um, you know, how this relates to who you are. Yeah, you know, I when I first started uh, classes in art school, I didn't know what, I really didn't know what to make. You know, I really had no idea. So I, I made a lot of one-off, what I call one-offs for different assignments. And then I realized when I looked back at groupings of those that I could see a microbiology theme, a microscopic theme. I saw cells, I saw bacteria. And so I started to focus on that. I uh, got access to the scanning electron microscope at UC Berkeley and started taking scanning electron micrographs of fabric because now I'm not a bacteriologist anymore, but I work with textiles. So it made sense to me to use a scanning uh, electron microscope with that. So I cut, yeah, I feel like once I realized that, I kind of milked it a little bit. Like I didn't really start embroidering. I didn't, I don't know when, I guess I started embroidering five years ago, but that's something I learned as a child. And then I, I brought it back and I'm finding that a lot of stuff I'm working on is something that I brought back from a childhood memory. Mm -hmm. In fact, almost everything relates back to that. So mm -hmm. yes, I agree with you that it's autobiographical. Okay, let's move on briefly to Stephanie and then one more, one more uh, question uh, because unfortunately we have to wrap up. So Stephanie. So besides sort of giving myself permission to make work about the things I was interested in by coming across felt as a, as a medium, I will also say that for the touchable things, that grew very directly out of the fact that I come from a very politically divided family. And it was a really painful time, especially around 2016, and seeing how much division there was in my own extended family and communities in our nation and in the world, I didn't want to make work about the, the lack of connection and about the distance. I know people who do that and that's, I don't want to stew on that. I want to try to think of ways to do the opposite or because I feel like you see more of the things that you're paying attention to. And I wanted to pay attention to more connections and that's what came out of it. So I think even if I'm not uh, really obvious in how I am in the work, it definitely is infused. And that was that was definitely something that, uh, that caused that work to come into being, the desire to have more of that in my life. 
Thank you. Um, any any last question? Um, me? Hey, not a. Oh, am I uh, am I muted or can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, it's not a question. It's just a comment uh, or an affirmation. Um, you know, the whole thing about the crafts versus the fine arts thing, you know, um, I just returned from uh, a trip to Europe and went to the, the Venice Biennale. And it was so amazing to see such an emphasis on female work, embroidery, female crafts. It was just so wonderful. And it was the best work in the whole Biennale. So keep up the good work, ladies. Um, Thank you. We're getting there. <laughs> um, uh, Shelley, can we take one more more question and, and risk running over? Okay. Uh, another question. Thank, thank you, me. I'm, we really needed to hear that. If we don't have a volunteer, I'm going to have to call on someone. <laughs> Well, I think it might be time to move into our opportunities section. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I have an interesting segue. Um, I was uh, mentioning to our host before the thing that there's this, uh, the Louisville, Louisville uh, company does this craft prize and uh, the it's open accepting things now. I'll put it in the chat, um, but it's, you know, really amazingly well-made pieces in the classic craft materials. So uh, metal, textiles, and other fiber, uh, glass, and ceramic. And uh, even just looking at the website for past winners, it's just fantastic. So if anyone makes anything out of those materials, then we qualify to try it out. Great, thank you. Um, I put up something that, that looks really dumb. You'll see it in the chat. Um, uh, Stephanie helped me put it up there. It's, um, I got it from Cafe, Art for Animals 2022. And the reason why, I, um, why I've included something so tacky is that all of the money that it makes go to animal, animal protection agencies. So you may just consider entering that, and that's in the chat. Thank you, Pamela. Does anyone else have something to share? A great show to go see, uh, a residency to apply for? Stephen. I have an opening coming on on the 27th of the month. All right. So if anybody gets near Gallery Route 1, uh, stop in and see what I'm doing. It's in the annex. That's that's my plug. <laughs> he is he is a colorist supreme. So if you're suffering from boring boring art, go see Stephen's work. <laughs> nice, yeah, and it's right on the tail of our box show closing, which happens this Saturday. Um, and the auction. That's right, right. So we hope that a lot of the box artists will be there. So they love to to meet their public. And um, and then from three to four, our silent auction becomes a live auction. And uh, we're raising money for Gallery Route One. And um, many of you already know that Gallery Route One is a nonprofit art gallery and we have outreach programs and um, we are looking for artist members and our artist members run our exhibition program and also show their own work um, once every 18 months or so. Um, and um, so I will put a link in the chat if you're interested. The next deadline to apply is um, December 31st. And so there it is in the chat. And um, anybody else? Oh. Where are you coming from? Who? Oh, we yeah, are, where is this? Where is this lecture actually coming from? It is coming from our computers, and I'm in Berkeley, California. So you're all in California. Yeah, well, pretty much. 
Pretty much. There's, there's a one Vermonter and one person who's temporarily in Wisconsin. And uh, let's see, that's all I know. Because I've loved Stephanie's work ever since I saw it in Pittsburgh at our international. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank yeah, you. we're uh, um, Gallery Route 1 is based in Point Reyes Station, which is in the Point Reyes National Seashore in Marin, California. Okay. <laughs> well, it was delightful to see you, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. <laughs> And to listen to you, Ruth, it was really great. Oh, thank you. I happened to see Stephanie's work at that Fiber Art International. I had a piece in that same show. Oh, so did you? It was fun, yeah. Oh my God! Well, I'm in Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. And I ran the 2019 International. Nice. The one that's before the one that's on now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you'll leave your, your specs for us in the chat. I do get the feeling that fiber arts, I've been told by a few people lately, like they're, they're coming up. People are actually paying even more attention and it's reaching a more of a wide audience, which is always fun to see. So. The International is on now till the 20th of, uh, it's almost over. Um, it's, we're finishing up this coming weekend. Wow. Um, it's held every three years. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty spectacular thing. And it's run by the Pittsburgh um, Fiber Arts Guild. When is the next uh, submission deadline for it then? Is it- uh... Well, it's not for three years, it's yeah, every yeah. three years. Okay, I'll have to look for it again. Yeah, hopefully it'll happen again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the meantime, uh, we have to talk about next month because uh, every month we feature to other artists, to new artists. And uh, this is a harm, hard act to follow, guys. But I think uh, we may, we may be able to kind of follow it. Um, we are featuring uh, Shannon Amadon and Deborah Kennedy. And they're two members of the Terra Arts Collective who, who work primarily uh, around the idea of, of, um, of Echo Arts of preserving our planet, and they will show uh, they will show different things together. But uh, Shannon Shannon, I'm sorry, well, works primarily in a on if I used to speak English in in encaustics, and she thinks a lot about insects, which is which is wonderful at this day and time, and. Um, and Deborah Kennedy, who, uh, who is a filmmaker, a bookmaker, a, uh, an installation artist, and many other things. So please join us next, next month. And that will, be, uh, that will be Wednesday, September 28th. Great. Also, just to mention that um, what Pamela was just describing is an exhibition that's part of our visiting artist program, and it shows in the the far uh, gallery called we call Project Space. And um, Deborah Kennedy is going to be having an event on the closing, which will be on October second. Um, and uh, gosh, I don't have a link handy to pop in, but. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can find information there. Uh, it's on Eventbrite, so you can look for Deborah Kennedy on Eventbrite. There's only a few tickets left at this point because we can we have to limit how many people we can have in the, the gallery. Is it on our website? Um, I am not sure if it is, to be honest, Pamela, so I will make sure it is. Okay. And... Um, all right. Well, I think uh, we're we're at the end here, so I'm going to do my little wrap up spiel, if that's okay. Um, only if I get to thank everybody afterwards. <laughs> well, you can thank people now if you like. I would like to thank you very much for our, our artists for coming tonight and and sharing so much with us, and and thank you to the audience. I'm I'm as I, again I'm thrilled because I know some of you. 
and know you to be very good artists and very good people. And, uh, and I just touched that you came. And I'm going to stop here and not say hello to people personally. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if you're interested in presenting as an artist at a future artist exchange event, then send an email to Pamela, Pamela Blotner at gmail.com. And if you were moved by today's presentation, then support Gallery Route One by making a donation in honor of the Artists Exchange. And uh, I put a link in the chat for your um, convenience. And I encourage you to use it. We really appreciate it when people make a donation of any size for our Artists Exchange program. And uh, thanks again for coming, and we hope to see you at our next Artists Exchange on September 28th.